Our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 100, where the psalmist calls the saints and all of those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and to be thankful unto him and bless his holy name. And the reason being is that God is our God. He's made the heavens and the earth, and he is our shepherd God who leads the people of the flock that Jesus has purchased with his own blood. Sheep of God, praise the Lord and receive now the shepherd's blessing for our worship. Grace, mercy, and peace be richly multiplied unto you from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Lord through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's now continue in our worship number 95 in the Psalter hymnal. <clears throat> Gracious God, my heart renew for this we pray as we would worship God, may our hearts be right as we worship him in spirit and in truth. The four stanzas, 95. going to be reading from the law of God this morning, Deuteronomy chapter 5, and that's the second uh, recorded promulgation or official declaration of the law of God that God gave. The first is in Exodus. It was given about a month or so after the people had been gathered around Mount Sinai, soon after the Exodus. Deuteronomy 5's setting is the plains of of Mamre or Moab outside of the land of promise. And Israel, after 40 years or so of wandering, is about to enter in. And so God gives to Moses again the law that the people may hear this word from heaven. And sort of a, a theme around which I would speak to you a few comments on the law, and then really even our whole worship service, is that God is our shepherd. And we are his sheep. 
We've heard that call to worship in Psalm 100 that reminds us we're sheep and God is our shepherd and so we're to worship him. But let's remember that. Israel hears the law of God here in Deuteronomy chapter 5 as the sheep of God. And they've been wandering for a long time, just like we wander in this world and sometimes wander into sin. We're always prone to wander outside of the revealed will of God and to desire something else. But God the shepherd reminds us and reminds us weekly and daily that he's still the good shepherd and he brings us back. The shepherd announces to Israel, to all of God's people of every age, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. There's God saying, I'm your God, you're my people. And we know how this happened, don't we, children? How did God show himself to be the God of Israel? When he brought them out of the land of Egypt, it was by a Passover lamb. Remember that? There was the blood of the Passover lamb. It was sprinkled on the doorposts of the people of God, signifying Jesus, our Passover, laying down his life for the sheep. So God says, I'm your God. And he says, first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Of all of the commandments that people say they know, if they're asked on the street in America, you know any commandments of God? Oh, yeah, you shall not kill, steal, something like that. This is the one they forget. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. As we're going to see in the sermon this morning, we live in an atheistic culture, and we are being battled on every side by the atheists. Seen an atheist lately? They're spoken of in the scripture, and you see them on the street. And we can be practical atheists ourselves. You shall have no other gods before me. You. Second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that's in the earth beneath or that's in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments." Third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Fourth commandment, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor, that's part of the commandment, and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God, in it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor your, any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, and that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. And here's the motivation. Motivation for keeping Sabbath even today. New Testament Sabbath. And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. You were dead in sins, in bondage to the devil Pharaoh. You were. And the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day, meaning on that day of all the days, rest in him who saved your life, redeemed you from destruction. Fifth commandment comes to all children, doesn't matter how old. Honor your father and your mother, as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long and that it may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, that's the sixth commandment. Seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Eighth commandment, you shall not steal. Ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the tenth commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Ten commandments written by the finger of God on stone, two tablets, front and back, 
signifying, I believe, even by the number and by the fullness of the revelation there that this is the complete and revealed will of God for God's people. They needed to know that. They're about to take the land and to be God's distinct people in the land of promise. We need to know that. The reality has come. Jesus has, has been given for a sacrifice that we not, now may be the ones who glory in him, in the land, the kingdom of heaven, in this whole world. And Jesus reminds us that the law is still rever- relevant If you love me, he says, keep my commandments, and his commandments are one which are two. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your soul. This is the first and the great commandment, and the second is like unto it, love that neighbor. Yes, the Syrian, but first of all, the one next to you the one in your house, the one in the pew, the one next to you, the one at the stop sign, whatever. You know the test of whether you love God or not, and you know something about how you show how God has loved you by loving unlovable people even. So written across the top of the tables, love God, love the neighbor for God's sake, people of God. Sovereign grace, people of God, visitor, people of God, one with us in the Lord's redemption, in the glory of being God's people. Let's show off. We love God so much. We're going to be his people, his way, in his holiness. And that's our joy. Let's now turn in our worship to song, meditative, meditative song. 15 in the Psalter hymnal, O why so far removed, O o Lord. Let me just read a few. This is a versification of the psalm we want to meditate upon this morning. And the first verse of that psalm is rather troubling because the psalmist is troubled. And one way to read the psalm is to enter the troubles of the psalmist, that we might enter the glories that he enjoys too. But, O why so far removed, O Lord, why so distant be? Why hidest thou thy face from us in in our anxiety? And he speaks of the wicked, and I'm going to call them atheists. But um, notice verse 14, the Lord our God is sovereign still. He's the king. The heathen all are slain. Thou, Lord, hast heard the suppliant's prayer, and dost his heart sustain. You know that God in your troubles? The Lord our God is king still in them all. He's king and the king of your salvation forever. 15, 1, 2, 11, 14, and 15 of 15.
Well, sheep of God, sheep of the pasture of God, God, our shepherd, is leading us in our worship to draw near, to draw closer to him. Maybe some of us were not really ready in our worship this morning, maybe even on the way. There was bickering in the car, there was distraction, you read the signs, you made comments about this, that, and the other thing. We weren't focused on God. That can happen to the best of us, as they say, to the worst of us, and everyone in between. With those whose faith is is very, very little, isn't it? And we need to remember, as we worship, God is leading us, and he would lead us closer and closer to him. It's kind of like the Old Testament priests, as they draw near to God, they're in the outer court, then in the holy place, and once a year, which is now our privilege to attend always, the high priest would go into the holy of holies. Well, in God's house of prayer today, we are about to pray, we're entering the holy of holies. What we need to know is that we're covered. Covered not by our excuses, not by our works certainly, but by the blood of the lamb. The lamb who is the shepherd who laid down his own life for us. You know that? People of God, sinners, we all are. You're covered by the blood of the Lamb as you trust in Jesus, renounce your sins. And we need to know that because that law can be a a great, great hammer to hammer us. We've read those Ten Commandments and and the first two right across the top, love God, love the neighbor. We haven't measured up, have we? We're just sinners again. And again, and again. Very humbling. The gospel is, however, there is forgiveness with God. There is the lifting off of the debt for you and for me. There is this wonderful place called being in Christ. And God He's given us faith to join us to him. Believe that. Know the peace and forgiveness of God. It's clear that without faith in God, there's no peace with God. No righteousness that you can claim. Nothing. And the sad thing is, Bless. Let's pray. Our Lord in heaven, our great God, we do know except for Jesus we are lost in our unbelief, in our atheism, in our pride, in our sins. And we know, we know we are unworthy to call upon you now at this time, Lord, even to pray for forgiveness. But you have said, come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden with sin and the troubles of this world. 
and the trouble of not responding as we ought to the troubles, complaining, worrying, fretting, seeking our own solutions, carnal though they be, so we can get some relief. Lord, we confess that our unbelief, our self-help, self-made gospel, that we can be happy by being self-made men and women, young and old. We're sorry, Lord, for our independence, our own declared and proud independence from you. We're sorry, Lord, for our idolatry, our covetousness, too, which is idolatry, as you say in your word. We're sorry for our stubbornness and our pride and everything that gives us the shake the fist at the authority of your word and at the authorities that be. We ask, Lord, your help. We may repent truly. May our worship not be marked by the hypocrisy that often marks worship and even ours. May we be praying and truly found not taking your name in vain. We ask, Lord, for your spirit and grace to continue our worship. And now as we pray for Tim and Deb, for their family, for Andrew, a baptized member, Lord, you would turn them. We pray, Lord, that there may be reconciliation, which is no little thing between sinners and the church of Christ here established in the earth. For this is your way. And Jesus has said, on the rock of the confession of people who know the word, and on this rock, Christ Jesus builds his church, and, and keys are given to open heaven to believers, to shut it to unbelievers. Oh, God. People walk in sin and they don't repent. And the word is brought in love as it has been in this case. And with humility and repetition and long-suffering. And they don't believe. They take a stand. They dig in. Oh, we grieve. As we have, we do now. And none of us is here proud, certainly not the elders or the pastor. None of us may be proud. Say all those ones, we're the men, we're the women, we're the children, the single people, the married people, we're the ones who are this today, but maybe those tomorrow. Lord, we pray, bring them back. As we know, we all must be brought back every single instant. He says that every single instant there's a nature, there's an inclination of us to leave the God we love. Lord, we pray, show your amazing grace to wretches who've been found now are lost, maybe never were found. Lord, show your way of power and that you are the king in the earth still. In the troubles of a church and this great and grievous tear-provoking trouble of having this discipline among us, and we all know it, we need your help. We need to be reminded that you are the God who is the God of miracle and of the marvel of free favor not dependent on any of us. You're the God who makes a church a very imperfect people, sinful people, and it's not that when you jump through the hoops, when you get it just right, when you know it perfectly inside and out, when you've read all the creeds and you, and you, can, you can write a doctoral thesis on it, that's not 
what makes for a church man or woman, but a humble spirit, a believing soul, a convicted sinner, and one who is resolute to serve the Lord and to be less of self and more in Christ every day. That's, that's the people of God. Help, Lord, the sinners to know and all of us to know again. We pray, Father, that you would bless this church. May it continue to grow. Grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's how we need to grow. Everyone, every family, every husband, every wife, every single person who may be discontent, everyone who may be neglecting neglecting the word of God and the means of grace, every one of us, Lord, who has troubles at work, maybe we're even without work, troubles in soul, troubles of a past, troubles of habits that have had their way and their grip on our life with many consequences, all bad. Lord, we pray, love us, that we may love you more. And as, Lord, we receive new members, and this is a great joy, and we grow that way, Continue to cause us, Lord, to grow in our witness and reaching out so that this church is known as a place where sinners are welcome who seek the Savior and to serve Him with all that is in them. May it be that there's freedom and joy here that's preached, a freedom high, far higher than what constitutions and declarations of independence do state and affirm and promote the freedom where the truth is. As Jesus says, the truth shall set you free. A freedom where the Spirit of Christ is, but where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. A freedom to serve, for Jesus Christ himself came not to be ministered unto, but to serve and to wash sinners' feet that they may wash others. Lord, may it be that there is this spiritual magnetism about the place, about the conversation, about the fruitfulness, about the, the wonderful love of Christ shed abroad in our hearts, about the fact that you've made us family and that there's always room for one more at the table and even many more, as many as you give. Lord, help Lord, us to declare here in life and in testimony the magnanimity of God, the greatness of God, the generosity of God. You, God, we love for your generosity to us, for your great love whereby you've given your Son and Spirit and Word and preaching and sacraments and a place, this church, other churches in the land, foretastes of heaven and home. Here are prayers, Lord, the prayers of the poor, of the oppressed, of the spiritual refugees, the prayer of the persecuted, our prayers that rise up from hurting hearts and souls in every land, and be the God who shows himself God in answering. And we shall testify among the atheists, there is a God, he hears prayer, and all who refuse to bend the knee shall be destroyed. But all who trust in that God shall be saved to the uttermost. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Your offering at this time for the general fund of the church will be received.
Let's sing now number 167, glorious versification of Psalm 87, Zion on the Holy Hills. Let's sing. May the Lord bless us as we sing 167. Let's take our Bible and turn to Psalm 10. What may be the last of the series of sermons on the Psalms for the summer, since the summer is about over, though maybe we'll linger with a couple of more just before the official fall begins. I want to consider this powerful psalm of both atheism and theism, the denial of God and the belief of God. Look as you read this psalm for those two themes, atheism and theism. Big words, children, for believing in God and not believing in God. That's the atheism part. And so we want to read Psalm 10. This is going to necessarily be a visit, um, brief too brief for to do justice to all of this psalm. We want to consider the theme of it, though, which I find to be uh, something like theism or believing God in the midst of atheism and the troubles of this world. And that's a fitting theme for our day. Psalm 10, the word of God, no subheading here, don't know the context, a word for all time. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. 
Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. But you have seen, for you observe trouble and grief. You repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. Thus far we read Psalm 10, the word of God, hear it, believe it. Let's hear now what's taught here. The Bible, we need to remember, is a book of God. It comes from God, and God has one message in this wonderful book, the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, the book is about God. And especially, the book is, the Bible is, about this God who's with us in Jesus Christ. He's the only God. He's the only God who's revealed himself, as the text reminds us, when it speaks of God as Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, the only God who saves. The God of the law that we read, who is the God of Israel, who led them out of Egypt, who leads sinners out of the bondage of sin, through Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, who is shed for us and through faith in him. The Bible is about this one message. As we begin Bible studies corporately and officially in our church, as we continue doctrinal studies in the Sunday discussions, as we think of renewed, being renewed in our education by the parents, sometimes with the help of uh, aides and teachers, Let's remember to teach them of God in Jesus Christ. Indeed, we have to learn of the, war, uh, the world. This is God's world. We have to learn of astronomy and, and geology and, and uh, engineering and, and medicine and whatever else we're called to learn about, history and, and English and math and so on, but all as subjects subject to God. That's the difference between godly education and ungodly education. There's just subjects there and stuff to learn, but there's no God to whom everything is subject. There's a world indeed, a fascinating world for people who call it fascinating and wonderful, but we need to remember it's the world that God has created. This is my Father's world. Teach the children that. Because we live in a nation, we live in a world of atheists who believe there is no God. And they believe that, or they live that way at least. And in Psalm 10, in fact, is a full-blown description of atheists, those who do not believe in God. So powerful is this description, part of it cited in Romans 3 by the apostle, part of the fact of the, the, the words of the wicked is cited there. But also, it's remarkable how, how clearly this atheist here, these atheistic people, are parallel and similar to the Antichrist, the one, the great beast who rises out of the nations and out of the seas at the end of time to, to enlist the whole world against God and against his anointed and to shake the fist also at the church of Jesus Christ. So much so is this... Uh, resemblance of these atheists here to Antichrist. Uh, St. Augustine, the early church father, was one who said this must be the Antichrist that's presented here, be that as it may, may, it's atheism that's presented. And atheists who are presented here in their ranting and raging and in their rampaging in the earth to make trouble and especially for the people of God. That's Psalm 10. That's the grimness, the darkness of Psalm 10. But Psalm 10, we know, being the word of God that it is, is also a believer's testimony of God. 
and a believer's confidence in God who is and who is near. doesn't seem like that at the first, where there's a question, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? But the resolution at the end, verse 16 and following, is God is king. And he's king now as well as forever. And he's king forever as well as now, even in the time of trouble. That's the confession here of the believer. Is that yours right now? As we begin to open up a little more this sacred text in Psalm 10. You see here, this believer here is reminding us to believe in the Bible, the God of the Bible. What he saw was not what he wanted to get only, but he needed to know revelation here. And so we as well, believers, must believe the God of the Bible. The believer here knew that God is God. The God of the Bible is God, and, and so must we. And so for today, atheists assault. They are attacking us. They are all over. And it's not just the drive-by media, but it's in the televisions, the Internet. The, the, it's seeping into the cracks of our home into the places we thought were exempt from the devil's actions. The devil has ways of creeping and whispering. And when we send the kids off to school, the devil has ways of whispering and sometimes shouting and perverting, even in so-called Christian schools and colleges. Let's be careful. Atheists are on the assault. Let's be believing. Draw near to God now and his word want to talk about here then Psalm 10, the assault of the atheists, and want, first of all, to consider the devil's strike force, the devil's allies, the devil's power in this earth, briefly, and this is described in Psalm 10. But then want to consider God's theist, God's believer, God's one who has God as his God. That might strike you. The theist is Jesus. The believer in God is, first of all, God himself revealed in this wonderful world. But then, for many theists. So the devil's strike force, the atheists, the theist, and many theists or believers in God. We're atheists. There are two kinds of atheists, uh, if you can say that. There's the atheists theoretically. The theoretical atheist. Maybe you find that one in Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God, and so on. There's people who have a mindset and who raise defenses and arguments about the fact they think that God cannot exist. These are the ones who do a lot of thinking, a lot of argument, uh, argue, arguing, they're the ones who now have radio stations in Grand Rapids, of all places, the Jerusalem of the West. There's atheistic uh, radio stations, mocking dialogues and, and debates that go on among smart whips of atheists against theists, and they grind the theists to pieces, many of them who foolishly enter into debate with the atheists. They're all around. And they have signs and the billboards uh, going into Grand Rapids and out of Grand Rapids, or at least they did. And it's infiltrating the whole place. And they're the ones in theory, but there's many, many more practical atheists, as we call them. Practical atheists. Those are the kinds who don't really think much about it, about the arguments for God or the arguments against God, but they live as if there's no God. These can often be even church people. Do you know that America, by poll and by experience of late and even years ago, is a nation that's practically, by the way it lives, atheistic. Practical atheists are in America. And so they may say, yeah, I go to church even, or I believe in heaven even, or I believe in God even. But then... By their lifestyle, they show that God doesn't really matter. Those are practical atheists. Those are hypocrites, the kind that God hates the most. They don't come out and say it, that God is not lit, worth living for, 
but that's how they live. And so they don't really give a snap about what happens to their children, just so long as the children learn how to be moral folks, up-biding citizen, citizens and those who respect uh, the authorities uh, after a fashion. So we have this in America, this practical atheism, and uh, I have to move on here. can't describe that, but I'm going to presently in more detail. The principle, I want to talk to you about the principle of this atheism. The, the main driving dynamo behind the atheist. What is that? Well, the principle is pride. We see that in the very first verse 2 of Psalm 10 that describes the atheists. The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. And then the prayer, let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. The wicked, verse 4, the wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. That last part of verse 4 could be translated, no God in his thoughts. No God. As the principle of an atheist's thinking, as the principle of his life, so that he doesn't seek God, he doesn't obey God, and he persecutes God's people. Think of the description that Psalm 2 lays out, and I'm just going to go through these verses. If you have your Bibles open, it might be helpful. If not, you can just think, hopefully think clearly, as I just read and make some observations of this lengthy description uh, of the wicked here who's an atheist. Number two, verse two, the wicked in his pride. There's that pride. Persecutes the poor and the wicked in his proud countenance. Verse four, does not seek God. I just want to dwell a bit on the pride. Pride is simply thinking too much of yourself. Pride is thinking, well, I'm the one that matters. I'm the center of the universe. And in this instance, and in all instances, pride is basically saying, I'm more important than God. I'm the one with whom the whole world has to do. And I'm the one, if there's going to be a God, who will make God in my image. You see how everything's reversed. Ever since the first fall into sin, when the devil said, Ah, Eve, don't you know? that if you disobey God just in this little itty-bitty thing and take of that forbidden fruit, you're going to be as gods. And you're going to be as gods so that you know good and evil and discern it not only, but basically the idea was so that you know good and evil for yourself. You decide for yourself what's right and what's wrong. And then you can do what you yourself decide you want to do. And for the children, that could be Proud children, that could be getting up whenever you want, going to bed whenever you want, no matter what mom and dad say, I'm going to just do whatever I want. And for all of us, it can be whatever, dealing in your business however you want, regardless of what God says. As husbands, it could be being a tyrant. We're going to do whatever we want. After all, aren't we the head of the home? And for women, because you're, you're seeing your husband as a sinner, you can say, well, I'm just not going to submit. I'm not going to be humble before this guy. He's too much of a sinner. So I'm going to live my own life and have nothing of submission and godliness, godly meekness in that marriage. And so it's pride. And this comes out again and again in the psalm. Remember how we've described this? And as ministers get older, you know, we, we lose the ability uh, to say new things in new ways, and so I say maybe new things or old things in the same ways, but I hope it's enough. I hope it's good enough for you to take it, to, to receive it, people of God. This, the proud sinner is, well, he's one who's on Mount Ego. He's one who's built a mountain. And all the, the way up to the mountain, it's impossible because there's only one who can occupy the top of Mount Ego. That's you in your pride or me in my pride. And there's, there's no one who can even relate to you because everybody's down the mountain. Ego, the problem 
of the atheist, the, the unvirtue, as I call it, the anti-God unvirtue, the exact opposite of the virtue of the fear of God and humility the atheists do show. And then they go on. Verse 3, in this pride, the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. How foolish. He brags not just about what he has, but what he desires. He doesn't even have it. But he's there, the life of the party, saying, I'm going to get a boat, a yacht. I'm going to buy a $70 million house and, because I've just won or sold off a company for $2.5 billion. And they boast of the nefarious things they desire even. I'm going to get that woman. I'm going to go to that Internet site which caters to those who would have an affair. As we've seen lately on the news, they boast of their desires. They boast. They brag. And they bless the greedy as if they could bless anybody. The other word that could translate that Hebrew is the covetous. They bless the covetous. That's what the wicked do. They think they're in the place of God. We'll, we'll go pronouncing blessings. Again, after all, can't we discern good and evil and call what's good in our eyes good and what's evil in our eyes evil? Yes, that's what we'll do. Because we're God. And so I bless the covetous. I bless those who grab at things of the world just as I do. And I rather respect them because... Because, well, it's just like me. And my son, who's just like me, I bless him as he goes out and pursues the world because that's the way I raised him. He's a chip off the old block. We're covetous together. We can grab this world together. They bless the covetous. The covetous who have a covetousness of which the Apostle Paul says, this is idolatry. Maybe that's why. They bless the covetous because there's another way in which the knowledge of the true God can be rid from the face of the earth. They're blessing those who are themselves practicing their atheism as if there is no God. They're the ones serving the master, Mammon, and not the Lord God, the King of Kings. I like that, they say. Because it's striking how not only does misery love company, atheists love company, Maybe it's just to spread the blame out so they, they don't know, they don't have to th deal with their conscience because other people are doing it. Why are we doing this? Why are we eating and drinking and being merry and not caring about eternity and that tomorrow we may die? Why? Because everybody else is doing it. And they say he who dies with the most toys wins. You know what? I believe that. That's how I live. I'm not going to worry, as you Christians seem to be worrying about eternity. Blesses the covetous, renounces the Lord. That has to be. You cannot serve God and mammon. When you bless the idolaters and you would get this whole world, and that's your life. God is in your life. Renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. That's, that's a striking way of describing what the wicked look like, the atheist looks like. When you're proud, you look like it. I don't know how that, what that looks like, except when I'm proud, then I can be proud. We all can be proud. Maybe it looks like this. You look down the nose at people. But the face, the face of a person can reflect the sin and the heart of a person. The very countenance of people, the eyes of foxes, you can see the shifty eyes the way they look askance at this and that, the way they snub the nose. And we all have ways of, of knowing what pride looks like, but then in their proud countenance, you see, they're not seeking God. They're not looking for God. God is in none of his thoughts, and that's the atheistic manifesto, no God. As another translation has it, as I said, no God in all of my thoughts. No God. That's the principle. That's the starting point. It's the starting point of evolutionary science. No God right across the top. That's the beginning of their scientific investigation. It's not what they conclude. It's what they start from. 
The wicked who have no God start from the mountain of their ego and the Babel that they built to make a name for man and his studies and his science and his theories of global warming. Not to comment on global warming here, but theories like that. The wicked start someplace, just as the righteous who have been given the new birth start now someplace, and they start with God. The atheist starts without God in his thinking, however he thinks, and then in all of his conclusions. His, here's another thing about the wicked. His ways are always prospering, and that seems to be a complaint such as Psalm 73, Asaph makes, it seems like the wicked, they're always getting their way. They're the ones who are the CEOs. They're, they're the ones who have the billions. They're the ones who have no, no care in the world, it seems. They're the leaders and the movers and the shakers of this world. They have the popularity, and, and here we are scraping out a living. Here we are with a conscience. Here we are with an inner man that dwells in, in, in righteousness, but with an outer man, the flesh against which we wrestle all the day, so that we're wretched. There's a prosperity, it seems, in the very thinking of the person who thinks no God, in the desires of the person, and in the outlook of the person, except for the most dire and the dismal doomsday folks of humanity. They say about God, and this is what they're saying, your judgments are far above, out of his sight. They, they don't think that God is anywhere near to judge them at all. The enemies of the wicked, he sneers at them because he's so confident. And this is another thing, terrible uh, description of the wicked, the atheist, verse 6 and 7, or verse 6, he said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. That's terrible. Do you know what? The wicked are many things. The atheists are many things. But one thing they're not, secure. If you be wicked, and I'm speaking to you, and maybe you're hearing this on the Internet or live stream as we're doing this, on the radio maybe later. If you are a practical atheist or a non-committed Christian even, and you're not really there, and God is not really your, your God. And you're thinking, well, you know, nobody's seeing. And I'm going through the motions, beware. Described in Psalm 10 is this carnal security, which is the downfall of the wicked. They actually think God's not near. He's not seeing. He doesn't care. He doesn't judge. Maybe he judges on the curve, and I'm better than other people. This wicked person will be destroyed if they persist in that wickedness and that practical atheism. Psalm 2 describes fittingly the atheists and also that they're on the attack. And that we move on is what they're all about in verses 7 through 10. The wicked in their hearts, the wicked with their body parts, the wicked with their philosophies and their words, they're full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. The idea is that he's out for the blood and the reputations of other people. To get to the top, to maintain to his self at the top, he's got to climb over other people, and that's what he does, especially with regard to God's people. Described here he is as sitting in lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocents. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. He said in his heart in all of this, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He'll never see. Those are the athe atheists. And this... Beloved is the description of those who do not believe in God, who are a pride of lions on the behalf of the lion of lions, at least the nefarious lion of lions, that prince of this world, the devil, who's a roaring lion. Here's the pride of lions. Here's the ones who go after the people of God and the oppressed. And again, it's just as at the first Back we are to the, the first sin, the pride of Adam and Eve. This is the pride of man. Don't we see that? See any atheists lately? Seen any atheists? You can't really say seen one atheist, seen them all. Though in a way it's true. 
But there's so many different kinds of atheists, aren't there? There's religious atheists. There, there's people who are very good people, as we'd say. There's bad people. There's ugly people. There, you know, all the in between. And there's, there's ways that atheism manifests itself that maybe it didn't um, years before. Years before, you know, it used to be that people actually thought the Bible was an authority on things. And now, uh, since modernism, we've become postmodern, and there's no truth. It's whatever goes, and there's no thinking about truth. And so this is the way that atheism is manifesting itself. There's no Bible anymore. There's no fear of God in the land. Oh, we can see it. The society, for example, that goes after things, that's the society we live in. Earthly this, earthly that, more gas here, cheaper gas there, um, uh, a job to get ahead, a uh, home and then a second home, a car and then a second car, a boat and then a second boat, and all these things. That manifests itself as the practical atheism of which the text speaks here. These people live for this world. Worldliness is the atheism of this word of God and of all of the scripture. Worldliness. When... The world is more important than God. When the world is more important than the word that God has spoken into the world, that's the atheism. We live as no God. Why are people, if they're not so happy with themselves, yet still atheists? Because all they do is complain, and all they do is worry, and all they do is, is you know, predict doomsday and so on, but they don't want anything to do with God. But now I want to tell you here, beloved, and before we partake of the supper, this is absolutely vital. We are the ones whom we are to see here. This word is written for our edification, for our learning. It's a psalm. It's a song. It's a description of what we are by nature and inclination. And I wonder if the psalmist, when he, in his humanity and weakness, complains to God that he's standing far off while all this atheism goes on unjudged, I wonder if he, the psalmist, was slipping into this practical unbelief in God. Why, he says, as we can say in our troubles, why? And quickly then the troubles of this life become not the trouble, but the way we react to it. We become practical atheists when we become cynics. And I tell you, I can be prone to that. Any of you? Cynics, not believing anything, and even God, even. That's how we end up, that's how we look. We become those practically atheists when our faith is so small. We don't understand what real blessing is. And we think it's just having a bigger house or a house like the person in the church does. Wish I could have that. We become those who grab for the things of this world and we're never happy until we get them all. But you know, as the saying goes, even the rich... They're not happy with all. You ask them. They'll say, are you happy with all? They'll say, no. I want one thing more. Always one thing more. So we're all the same. Whether you're poor, whether you're rich, or in between, one thing more. That's worldliness. That's practical atheism. And I want to say in the church world, here is where the atheism is so glaringly apparent in this way. When we as Christians live with a creed, we'll take a creed, we'll believe the Reformed faith, we must believe the Reformed faith, we say it's so logical, God saves sinners. That's a Reformed faith. That's what a young man just confessed before the consistory this past Tuesday, praise the Lord, God saves sinners. But I say, and I say to the young man, I say to us all, we can be practical atheists in this way. We forget Christ and we believe not the Christ. And many churches are forgetting Christ, forgetting the blood, speaking of what we can do maybe for God, but forgetting the God who has done something for us. And I would remind you 
that this text, this passage full of atheists and even believers who are not so strong, points us always to the God who is near to us in Jesus. And that's what we need to remember here. Yes, there's atheists all over the place, but God has sent his Son. God has sent God to be clothed in human flesh and to humble himself and to save sinners. And this one, Jesus, became the principal believer in God. Isn't that remarkable? I hope this doesn't astound you and even be a stumbling block to you when your minister is saying that God in Jesus becomes the one who believes in God. God in Jesus becomes the one who takes on human flesh and he becomes a believer. Now, in his divinity, God doesn't really believe in himself. He is himself. But in his humanity, in which he suffers and in which he becomes human, a, hum, a human in every way except sin, he becomes the principal theist, the principal believer in God. And he believes in God so that he will do the plan of God for him. In the volume of the book of the counsel of God, in all of the revealed scriptures, it was said of him, I come to do your will, O Lord, and Jesus comes to do it. Now that's believing God. That's believing on the ground. That's practical uh, theism in Jesus, even though it be a cross. There's the one. The believer in God who believes even in the way of trouble, of temptation, and of dereliction. You see here in Psalm 10, you have this question that sounds an awful lot like the question of Jesus on the cross, which was not set in sin and unbelief, but was set in the agonies of his throes of bearing the wrath of God. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? Isn't that what Jesus said? Flip over to Psalm 22. Go to the cross, the fourth word, the hour of darkness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why, my God? No longer even seeing him as his father, but my God, why? I don't get it. I don't understand it. Now, is Jesus here being an atheist? Of course not. But he's being a theist on the ground and even going to hell, and that is for us to remember. God has now made us believers, believers in the trouble Believers made even for trouble and for fires and furnaces and lion's dens and roaring rivers of trouble. We're made for that. Why? Is that so God will kill us? No. It's so that God would inflame us in belief in the God he always has been whose ways are higher than ours. That's what preaching is all about. Preaching this book of the God who is and who is near, even in trouble, especially in trouble, because he will be the God who makes grace to shine, you see, in the darkness, who will ordain sin even, that it may be a servant of his to show the glory of his grace in Jesus. Preach the cross, Congregants, consistory demanded of your preacher that we hear of Jesus and that we hear so that we believe in God in the midst of all this atheism and that our children do and they confess their faith. No matter what it takes, no matter what a cross now we bear, and we take the sacrament, those amazing emblems and banners of the king who broke his body who shed his blood for sinners and that we might believe. And the final conclusion then we make of Psalm 10, the Lord is king forever. Not just tomorrow, but now. Forever and ever, the Lord is king. And so, so true is the fact that God will judge the wicked and condemn them the psalmist speaks as if in the present tense, the nations have perished out of his hand. 
And the prayers of God's people are answered. Your prayers, beloved. And I know a lot of people have gone to funerals lately. The prayers of those who go through the valley of the shadow of death, they're heard. The prayers of you not having an easy time of life, maybe not having an easy time in marriage or being single or growing old or with a disease or with a broken home. The prayers of the humble are answered. Only believe. Only believe and give God the glory. Amen. This time it's our privilege to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We're thankful to God that we could do this regularly, reminded in the form that I read uh, quite often here, this form uh, adopted for our use at Sovereign Grace, that this is a blessing blessing of the supper and a blessing that we could partake of this together as congregation and those who have been given permission by the consistory. We welcome you, all who may be observing. We pray that you will be blessed in the observing and the believing that God is your God too. So as we now receive and celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we'd be careful to pay attention to the words of the institution of this, and that's found in 1 Corinthians 11. And I read 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 29. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, This is my body which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. In like manner also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink the cup, ye proclaim the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man prove himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup, For he that eateth and drinketh, eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, if he discern not the body. That was 1 Corinthians 11. From this and other scriptures, we see that the Holy Supper is a sacrament, whereby we all in the worship of God, and as we assemble together as his church, under the godly oversight and care of Christ's elders, are regularly to remember and honor the death of Christ on the cross as the only propitiation for our sins, and as the sure pledge of his return to take us to be with him in glory. In the supper, we're to partake of him by faith as believers in God. This we do believing that as surely as we partake with our mouths of the bread and the cup, we partake also by faith of Christ himself signified and spiritually present in the sacred supper, who himself also speaks to us in the word that is declared. We are as well rightly to examine ourselves in the partaking of the supper. This means we do righteously and humbly concur with the judgments of God's own law, that we are miserable sinners exposed to God's wrath unless we are washed by the Savior's blood. We believe the sure promise of God that all our sins are forgiven us only for the sake of the passion and death of Jesus Christ. We are minded henceforth to show true thankfulness to God in all our life, in love to Him, and our neighbor. So, beloved, as we would come to the table now, we're to remember that this supper, which is not for hypocrites and those who live without repentance and godly sorrow for their sin, is nevertheless an ordinance appointed by God, not to discourage the contrite hearts of the believers, as if none might come to the supper of the Lord, but he that is without sin. For the supper is given to us exactly because of our weakness and because of our failures in order to increase our faith by feeding us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. As in the word of God there is the promise of his favor, so also our heavenly Father has added the supper to confirm his promise. In the supper, therefore, we're called as sinful and yet freely forgiven children of God to come and to partake, to taste and see the Lord is good and gracious, for he that is our very wonderful God, our Savior, is the one who hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us after our iniquities, but instead, in his loving kindness, hath removed them all for Jesus' sake, as far as the east is from the west. Let's pray together. Almighty 
everlasting God, King forever and ever, who by the blood of your only begotten Son has secured to us a new and living way into the Holy of Holies. Cleanse our minds, cleanse our hearts by your word and spirit, that we, your redeemed people, drawing close to you through this holy sacrament, may enjoy fellowship with the Holy Trinity, through the body and blood of Christ our Savior. Through this sacrament, by your own word and spirit, Lord, may these common elements be now set apart from ordinary use, and through them may we be nourished with the body and blood of the Lamb. Amen. that we may be nourished with Christ, the true bread from heaven. Let's now lift up our hearts to Christ Jesus, our advocate, who is at the right hand of his heavenly Father. Let us firmly believe all he has promised, not doubting that we shall be nourished and refreshed with his body and blood through the working of the Holy Spirit as surely as we receive this bread and wine in remembrance of him. The bread which we break is a communion of the body of Christ. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Take and eat and remember and believe the body of Jesus Christ was broken for a complete remission of all our sins. The cup of blessing which we bless is a communion of the blood of Christ.
Let's turn in our Psalters to number 138 and sing meditatively, 138, about the sweet communion we have in Jesus Christ, certainly symbolized by the supper, the communion we have with him and one another. Stanzas 1, 3, 4, and 5, omitting the second, 1, 3, 4, and 5. Beloved in Jesus Christ, take and drink ye all of it, and remember that the blood of Jesus was shed for a complete remission of all our sins. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this holy feast, the blessing of it. We're unworthy to partake of this meal, yet you've called us kindly. You've clothed us in Christ's righteousness, we who were naked, now so clothed that we might come boldly and feast with joy in your presence. Indeed, we do now rejoice, for instead of wrath, we have received your pardon. In the place of fear, we have hope. Your people know that, Lord. And now in the sacrament, we've been reassured of these blessings, of the truth of our great high priest and mediator of the new covenant, who's reconciled us to you and even now intercedes for us at your right hand. Strengthen us, we pray so that having received by faith of Christ himself and his grace, we may now, by your Spirit, in light of your most holy word, honor you with our bodies and with our souls, with a life that is to the glory of your holy name. As sheep of the Good Shepherd, we do so pray. Amen. Rise and receive God's benediction, and we'll sing the final doxology, 487. Hear God's parting blessing as we have received the word and sacrament of the Savior. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
Amen. by the ministry of Reverend Mitchell Dick, where she teach Lord's Day at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. at the chapel at Piper College, located at 3333 East Beltline Northeast, between Three Mile and Four Mile Roads. You are most cordially welcome to join us for worship or visit us online at www.sturc.org or contact us by phone at 616-406-8563. It is our prayer that the Lord would add his indispensable blessing to this ministry in order that his name would be glorified through the edification of his people and the translation of sinners out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his glory.